Insight Exposing Narcissism is sponsored by Pinch of Nom, the creative low-calorie cooking books that makes eating healthy delicious. From fake ways to home comforts, Pinch of Nom has a recipe for everything. Check out their latest book now and fall in love with cooking again. Welcome to Insight with Katie McKenna and Helen Villas. Hi, Katie. How's it going? I'm really good, Helen Villers. I heard you on another podcast the other day. Do you know what? Do you want I to always tell know it. <laughs> I do, but I always know it's serious when you use my full name. It's hilarious. It's such a mum thing. <laughs> Helen Villers. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got a new podcast. Yeah. It's very exciting. And, yeah. And there, I think that was really unfair the way I kind of loaded that question because no, obviously you had told me about uh, doing it and I had one of the first lessons to it, which I'm yeah. delighted about. Uh, and it's really good. So, yeah, tell people what you're up to. It's called The Luxury Mind. We'll put a link in the show notes so that you can find it. Um, Dr. Paul on TikTok mm-hmm. is um, Love Dr. Him. Paul Psychology. He's amazing. Yeah. Psychology Answered, I think he is on um Instagram, but he's... Oh, I don't follow him on Instagram. I must look that oh, up. Should, uh, yeah. He's um, absolutely hilarious. Mm. We come from a similar background. <laughs> he's so funny, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah, we come from a similar background, but his speciality, he's a psychologist. He's a, do- he's a doctorate in psychology and he's a uh, luxury... I'm going to get this wrong. Luxury consumer behaviorist. Mm-hmm. So his job is to show big brands how to make people buy their products, how mm. to influence people into buying. And it's unbelievable. It's very interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It's so interesting. So the podcast is all about why we buy stuff, why mm-hmm. we feel like we need to, what's going on for us psychologically. We get into some controversy around what's going on. And so the first episode, which is the one that you've heard, is all about Christmas presents. Mm. And um, at, at Christmas, there was a woman on or a family on TikTok who showed this massive pile of presents that they'd bought their children that was like 200 presents for these kids who were like five and seven. So we were talking about the need to do that. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking about the polarization in the comments and the different type. It's just, there are so many phrases that he uses and I'm like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's Um, very interesting interesting. watching and listening. And it's also, uh, if, if it's fair to say, because I I don't want to devalue the content, but it's, it's lighthearted. It's really interesting listening. It's not obviously delving delving into trauma and childhood trauma. (laughs) It's talking about the the psychology behind the behavior around consumerism and, and our wants. And with some funny stories from yeah. our own experiences and stuff. and That's I mean, what's really interesting then as a listener, listening right. to them. They are so engaging then for me as the listener. And then I'm really oh. feeling that I'm getting to know, I suppose, Paul a little bit better because I only know him through a, a parasocial relationship from seeing yeah. him on TikTok. And also I had did a collaboration with him. Uh, Somebody had asked him about the phone response. So he hit me um, in answering that. So seeing this kind of extra personal side and when he answers his videos, it's actually when he shares himself um, personally. It's it's just, it's very funny and and there's lots of humor. So yes, you have an avid uh, listener and fan going forward. Oh, thank you. No, it's so fun and it's lovely to... Um, do something a little bit lighthearted mm. because obviously what we do is brilliant and I'm so into it and I love it but I think um, it can get heavy sometimes there is a you know depth to this content that that we're just not replicating on that mm-hmm. podcast. we're not talking about trauma we're talking about humans and behavior and and speaking like, of humans right? shiny talk- things right so. Yeah. And speaking of humans, we're multifaceted, multidimensional mm. people, right? We have different needs. And, you know, when I think of any relationship, even in terms of me with my husband or or you or with my other friends, we can't get all our needs met by one person. And it's actually a lot of pressure on one person yeah. if they're to meet all our needs. So if my husband is to meet every single one of my needs, the pressure on him will be so great and it will actually be smothering in the relationship. So it's really Mm. healthy when we recognize that we have these other needs and then we have other relationships in our lives to fulfill them. Because one of the questions that I had got asked was, am I anyway uh, annoyed, put out, worried that you Mm. were doing this? And that question, uh, although understandable, I think why it asked, it nearly baffled me because I was like, Absolutely not. I feel very secure Mm. and safe in the relationship with Helen. Mm. And she gets to be this multifaceted person and do other things. And this was actually something in terms of round boundaries that we discussed 
right at the beginning in terms of Mm -hmm. uh, what is us and do we have freedom to explore other avenues? And for me, that's a a huge part um, and a need that I would have also. So there's only support and encouragement uh, from my side to you both. Oh, thank you. And and absolutely. And I get it. I do understand why people would Mm. ask that question because we we come presented to the world as a pair yes. right in in this capacity but we are individuals mm-hmm. we do have our own different interests different things and it's really important that those parts of ourselves get nurtured as well and much like if you went and did a podcast with someone I would just be like oh where can I download it and actually what's so fascinating right here's the thing if I was in any way nervous about your reaction or you feeling put out or left out or excluded or punishing me because you felt like mm. that it's controlling. Right. right. First of all, yeah, really controlling. But second of all, I wouldn't be sharing it with you. Whereas what's happening is I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to share this with Katie. And every time we've done something, I'm like, mm. can I forward it to Katie? And he's like, yeah, 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 absolutely. And that's and- really interesting because had this be the first I heard of it, I, I that would I would have been a little bit perturbed. I would be like, what? I, I speak with you nearly daily and 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 I haven't been told of this so so why so then I actually would have felt excluded whereas as the idea was developing and you were having these conversations you were just sharing them with me and then I was yeah. uh, uh, interested and supportive so yeah there was nowhere where where you felt that you were going to be punished which left the door open for then to you to be able to share more uh, because mm. in our relationship, I'm allowed to be autonomous. Yes. I'm allowed to be an individual. And I don't have to manage your feelings around the fear that you maybe might feel rejected because I'm doing it with Dr. Paul and mm. not you. And like, it's just a really interesting thing because I think in my previous pre therapy life, mm. I probably would have been nervous to tell you. Or maybe it's not even you. I would have been. Because in this relationship, it didn't even cross my mind to be nervous Mm. about telling you. But I have been in relationships where I've been like, oh, they're going to be annoyed that I'm doing Mm. this thing without them and yada, yada. And and anyway, I think it's just really telling of the safety and sanctity of this relationship that I'm allowed to be an individual and autonomous. And that's what it should be like in all relationships, because there's the learning, right? Mm -hmm. There's the growth for me Mm -hmm. that if I was with somebody else, like a partner or someone, and I was like, oh, I'm going to go and do this thing. Well, why didn't you include me in it? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't think I needed to. Well, let's think in terms of the narcissistic parent or the narcissistic partner. Oh my God. In terms of... You just gave me a bit of a trigger. (laughs) (laughs) But in terms of autonomy and going and meeting your own friends, think of the jealous narcissistic partner. And I'm going to just go with a heteronormative example here, you know, a boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife, and the the wife wants to pursue her own career, maybe, you know, get a job going Mm -hmm. out with friends. And then straight away, he is either devaluing her or jealous. Who are you going out with? I remember Helen you did a skit which was a wonderful Mm -hmm. uh, example of this where she's putting on makeup in the video and and he's calling her really derogatory names that actually I nearly don't even want to repeat well and the friend scathing to her that you're going out with yes this yeah he calls her a a a slush or a tramp isn't that what he calls her are you going out with her all the terrible yeah Yeah, so then that is to prevent her from going out in future because it won't be worth it the fear of having this argument and the Mm -hmm. stonewalling and the abandonment that will ensue so she will think that it's her own choice then that it's just not worth it to go out whereas really it's the fear that she doesn't want to face the reality of the relationship and the control in that yeah absolutely Mm. yeah so it's a really telling thing because it's that thing of And I think a lot of people will relate to this idea as well of when um, the narcissistic parent finds out that you've met up with a sibling or a Mm. cousin or an aunt without knowing about it. They get really angry and they start kind of being like, why wasn't I informed? How did Mm. you do that? And the reason they get annoyed is because they can't control the relationships. They don't like the idea of you having a relationship separate to them that they're not included or involved in. And I think people really need to hear this. It's not normal for your parent to be included in every relationship you have with family members or any other one but but we see it over and over again where the narcissistic parent will feel so entitled that they will force their way into all the relationships you're in and the um you know especially around your siblings well what do you mean you got together with your sibling and you didn't invite me Mm. why did you why are you seeing my sister and not telling me that why wasn't I included I'm so hurt I'm so it's like why wasn't I invited why didn't you tell me I wasn't wasn't told that Mm. it's it's so 
punishing that you're not allowed to have like literally you get punished for the autonomy mm. and individual relationships so i think what i really want everyone listening to hear the healthy response to me having a relationship with somebody else a close relationship doing a podcast with somebody else the healthy response to that is oh that's amazing tell mm. me more about it mm. and what can i do to support you can i share a link can i repost a video can i do this like the other whatever thing it is and yeah, it's a it's a really interesting mm. difference between the punishment and the celebration. Of it's it. it's a it's just a stark contrast. I mean, it's complete. It's black and yeah, white, isn't it? It is. It really complete is. Complete opposite. Well, anyway, enough about me. What's going on with you? <laughs> well, for anybody interested, the link is in the show notes to go and check out uh, Luxury Mind. And yes, back to what's the crack with you? Are kids are all back to school now this week for me and you. Back into a yeah. little bit more routine. Oh yeah, thank God. <laughs> I don't do well without that routine mm. and you know yeah what about you oh yeah don't, why are we talking about me again stop like, carry on to me. <laughs> no well, I have I have no crack really um no. I've done it all we had a we had a quiet weekend no. which after Christmas it, it was yeah and, and warranted to to just chill so um I have no fun so I think that's why I'm putting oh, it okay. on to you <laughs> fair enough I went out last night mm-hmm. so uh yeah and surprisingly sprightly this morning um <laughs> I did a really impulsive thing, unsurprisingly, and went and messaged my girlfriends and said, oh, are you around? Do you want to, does anyone want to go for a cocktail tonight? And two of them were like, yes, oh, let's fabulous. go. I and love like, impromptu things. And actually, you yeah. say not surprisingly to do something, but is that not surprising for you to be, you talk about being spontaneous uh, like that, that normally you wouldn't. So is that I mean, not... there was enough hours, but then I did have instant regret. I'm going to share this. <laughs> 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 because so I was like oh it'd be so lovely yeah I love to see everyone too. yeah right sometimes I do and sometimes I, but mm. I suppose I was in charge of the impromptu bit so okay. that might make a Very difference different. too um and I you know so it was all me kind of organizing it and I don't mean that in a controlling way it's just that I knew what the plan mm-hmm. was so I, I had there was no surprises I suppose so I sent out this message two of them were like yeah absolutely but I'd done it at like midday and you and I were then in meetings all day (laughs) about the book with publicity and marketing and Mm. it was very interesting and exciting but it was a lot of focus and like concentration Mm -hmm. and we and then I had clients in the evening so I didn't finish work until six yeah and I kind of was crawling over the line a bit and then I was like oh no I've got to get up and get dressed to go out and so it by the that they got here and then I was like just force yourself, Phyllis. And then I had a couple of espresso martinis and I was like, let's go. <laughs> um, <laughs> absolutely lovely. And it, do you know, again, I'm reminded about what real friendship looks like. Mm. And they both listen to the podcast and they're both like, they're both asking all questions about the book and what's going on and how exciting and glamorous and all this stuff. And, and it's really sweet. And then we were sat there and one of them said to me, and she's a close friend of mm-hmm. mine, like really close. And with absolutely no sense of passive aggressiveness or anything. She's just like, you and Katie are just like, it's amazing. Mm. Like, it's so lovely that you found each other. And it's just, it's so random, isn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, like this randomer off TikTok that I always call you. And and she could not speak more kindly and lovingly of our relationship without absolutely no sense of threat to her and my relationship. And they both were just singing our praises. They were thrilled for me. You know, like it was just so telling. There's such a contrast in my life at the moment and it's a bit miserable, but there's there's such a contrast between the people who are thrilled and cheering me on and the people who are pissed off about me doing well. Like there's such a fucking contrast. It's, and one highlights the other horrifically and in a really good way too. So yeah. And I can relate to that because I have people in my life, some that listen to the podcast and some that don't. Mm-hmm. And that's that's valid. That's up to them. But Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the, the ones that are what I would consider close to me, uh, whether mm-hmm. they listen to the podcast or not, are interested in in me and are delighted for air relationship. So I have one friend mm. in particular who, you know, like watches me on TikTok and stuff, but doesn't uh, listen to the podcast. And she, she loves you. <laughs> like she's oh, is Helen coming over and what's happening. And she's oh, still yeah. really interested. So this is not that they have to be invested in the podcast, but I have other people in my life and less so in my life now, <laughs> I have mm. to say, because it's really interesting that when they were not interested 
in our relationship yeah. at all. And in fact, sometimes hearing devaluing comments from them then through mm -hmm. other people. And that's mm -hmm. just really, really telling. Because again, yeah. is this somebody in my life that is supporting me and encouraging me and happy for me when I'm in a healthy uh, relationship mm -hmm. and also then doing good things? Or is this somebody and is it coming from jealousy, envy, control, dominance? And that's yeah. all about them. And I can have empathy where that would come from, from them yeah. for their own past yeah. trauma. But I now no longer want to uh, be in a relationship with that and have to silence myself then to not be able to talk about good things. And again, not centering myself all the time because in my other relationships, no. there's so much room for them yeah. to speak. But I just cannot stress uh, what you've just actually highlighted, Helen, and said yeah. that the difference when you're in relationships where people are supportive and encouraging and really, as I'm saying that, isn't that, shouldn't that be the bare fucking minimum when we're talking like about the friends? Bare minimum, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Right. But like for any that's relationship. been lacking. And then here uh, you're receiving it. It it feels so much. Whereas actually, yeah, it, it should be the bare minimum in, in a relationship I, to be yeah. encouraging and supportive of a friend when they're doing something. Like, it's just is, I would, I refuse to make myself small to make people feel comfortable anymore mm. because I spent my whole fucking life doing it. It didn't help me in any way, shape or form. Mm. And now I've stopped apologizing for <gasps> myself. That's one of the huge. things, yeah, mm. one of the things you and I have talked about mm -hmm. is people will say to me, oh, this is, I feel cringe even saying okay. this out loud. People will say to me quite often, is there anything you can't do? Mm. And because I can turn my hand to most things mm -hmm. and I'm quite, you know, I don't, I don't know what the word is. I don't I see it. See, I'm very uncomfortable even saying that out loud. <laughs> but people say it to me and I actually hear it as an instant criticism. Like it's like, oh, is there anything you can't do? Like it's, they're pissed off with me for being able to do that. Like I can pick stuff up really quickly and, and I'm, that's what a blessing. Mm -hmm. Like I think that's amazing. And I'm really lucky about that with that. But it, it's also just genetics. I'm not in charge of that. It's just a bit like, well, okay. And and what I hear when they're saying that is the only thing you can't do is, can you stop making me feel shit about myself? Mm. And it, I refuse to do that anymore. Yes, I'm good at doing stuff, but I also want to show you what I'm doing too. And I want to share it with you and I'll teach you what I know. And I'll, like you and I and in, in, um, editing, for example, mm -hmm. I, I've sat and taught you how to use yeah. the software and you keep going to me, you're so patient. I'm like, no, I just like teaching. Like mm. it's a fun thing to there with somebody it connects you and I whatever. hope that I never have to use that skill again you know. <laughs> <laughs> actually kind of me too I'm a bit traumatized from the first few episodes of the podcast but the point is there's a big difference in people who ask me to shine bright and people who ask me to dull that shine and I'm refusing to dull myself tarnish myself anymore okay there's so much to kind of pull apart in that and, and really just even quickly and briefly. So one, you're not sitting in superiority and we can use that example really well with the, the editing process that you were like, yeah, mm -hmm. I know how to do this thing because I, I did something before and I know the skill and I can teach you the skill. So you weren't sitting in any superiority or gatekeeping this information. You were like, no, like you can learn this. And by the way, you did have patience. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's just a fact. You did have patience because my knowledge on that was zero or next no, to but zero. Then, no, because to be impatient was to be to punch you for something you don't know and that's not fair I'm just teaching you it's not being patient see this is something from your history mm. that someone taking the time and care to show you how to do something without shaming you for not knowing how to do it <laughs> Sol's just called you out massively yes, on the podcast definitely but if anyone's watching I wasn't Zoom, being patient yes. I was just being a kind human being because why would I punish you for not knowing something that you've never needed to know before mm. Okay, this is a whole separate <laughs> podcast to you, for me to, <laughs> to delve into that, okay? I'm, yeah. I'm hearing that I need, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Bing, bing, bing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that I wanted to just go back on what you said was the difference when somebody is complimenting you saying, mm -hmm. oh my God, you can turn your hand to anything. Or mm -hmm. there is a devaluing um, and an insult when somebody is saying yeah. to you, oh, you can, oh, is there anything you can't do? Yeah, it's just so snippy. It's that backhanded compliment. It's actually, it's an insult. They're insulting you, but then it's going to be so hard for you to hold them accountable because they're going to say, no, I, I didn't mean it like that. Well, that's what negging is, right? So they're actually mm. negging me. Yeah, Because they're giving me a compliment, but making me feel negative with it. Yes. Like, oh, you'd look so good in that dress if it was a different colour. Mm. Oh, 
gosh, imagine if you lost five pounds, how nice you'd be. You know, it's that it's the negative yeah. compliment and it's designed to make you feel like shit and ashamed that you have this thing. Mm-hmm. So here I am, somebody who can turn their hand to most things and pick things up quite quickly. Mm. And again, it's genetics. There's nothing that I have done to do that. Like that's just genes that have come down my way. And um and I'm very fortunate for it, but I have been punished for it my whole life too. Mm. And it's that thing of not enough too much. Like it's always been, oh, Helen, stop showing off. Mm. And it's like, oh, I'm not showing off. I'm just interested and yeah. I want to share this thing. And, oh, my God, did you know this thing about – one of the things that gets mentioned all the time with me is that I know so much random shit, <laughs> like so <laughs> random facts and like like weird little things mm. that people don't normally know. And it's really interesting how people react to that. They're like, either they're like, oh my God, how do you know that? Mm. It's like, oh, I read a lot. You know, like, it's just reading. All, Those you know, random facts it. don't uh, stay in my head. They, I'm like, oh, and yeah. even when you share those things, I'm really interested. And then they're, they're gotten. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> that's hilarious because to me, it's like they stick in my brain. But yeah. also, I forget what I ate for breakfast. So mm-hmm. it's like it's like weird what sticks in my brain and what doesn't. Isn't that really interesting? Because you would say to me that my memory is is better than yours with the things yeah. that I can remember. Whereas, and I do remember those, and I fully accept that you don't remember those things. Yeah. With this, like your your memory, then when you read something, how your how that like you're saying that that sticks in your brain. In. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Because you and I had something yesterday, didn't we? It was so fucking funny. (laughs) And I'm going to tell everyone because it was so funny. I was like, right, I've got this idea for... um, (laughs) It was so funny. Like, I'm so ashamed of myself at the same point in a really (gasps) non-toxic way. It was so funny. So I was like, right, we're talking about book promotion and what we could do, like, on the socials. And I was like, well, I've got some ideas and I've done this and this and this and this and this. And then I've got this idea, but don't you dare nick it. Like, I don't want you to, like, don't do it. and um. But and I was lighthearted. You were because you were saying I, you know, I know that you like, wouldn't, you, and you actually said yeah. that I know that you wouldn't. But I, I need to again. I need to state we just that. say it because yeah. this is just us establishing boundaries, mm-hmm. right? And we do this all the time because it's not that we think the other will do it. It's just that once I've said it out loud, we know what the clarity of it. And right? again, if there's a wound from somebody, if that has happened in somebody's yeah, previous relationships, has, you know, well, then massively. that is why then you are stating this in in new relationships. But anyway, continue because yeah. I know so, where this is going. <laughs> So proud old me, feeling a little bit like, I've got this fucking insane idea. It's so good. You're going to love it. Reels off what the idea <laughs> is. And then Katie was like, yeah, Helen, that's the idea I suggested to you when we were over here. And I was like, wait, what? And then it suddenly clicked in my brain and I remembered having, and I had actually changed it a little mm-hmm. bit. So it wasn't exactly the same, but I was like, oh my fucking God, oh. you did. And I was like, well, now I've just questioned all my memories and all my <laughs> creations because now I'm wondering how many of them are actually mine and how many aren't. But but we would have talked about mm. it if you've if I had ripped off something that you'd given me, I, we would have talked about it, right? And in that, let's just let's just go this further to actually show then what a healthy conversation around because you were like, oh my oh, god, okay. yes, right. So you didn't deny and gaslight. You were like, oh, no, nope. I do remember that. And then you went, shit, do you want this? And you were yes. giving me full autonomy. And yeah. had it been something that I was really passionate about, and I was like, no, I did suggest the idea, but it's so far off me actually having time and and doing that. Mm. It was, yeah, for one of the skits and I was going, and and you've changed it and it's a great idea and you're planning on doing it very soon. So run with it and I'm, and I'm happy for you. This afternoon. This afternoon, yeah. okay. Yeah, this afternoon. <laughs> It'll be up and out by soon. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's just it, right? Because the minute I realised what had happened and that I, Katie was right, it was, yes, I had a tiny bit of shame, right? I want to own that because I did go, oh, no, I'm a bad person. And mm. then I was like, no, I just missed. So here's adult me talking to little me mm-hmm. going, I just misremembered and I just didn't realise. And I had changed the idea enough that it wasn't the exact carbon copy, but it was originated in mm-hmm. what you had suggested 100%. And so the right thing for me to do is go, well, then I should put my hands off that, mm. right? And, because, and also, or just to offer it, mm. right? Not to be like... And also, because we were on a Zoom with Nicola, so you're sitting with two people where there was no judgment. So there was no shame coming from us. Whereas no. had you been sitting with somebody that was judgmental we and shame, yeah, we were, and was <laughs> criticizing. But I want to talk here about responsibility because it was my responsibility in that point 
to say that because this yes. is where resentment builds and grows in yes. relationships. So if I hadn't mentioned that and and sat that and was starting to internalize going, Helen, that's that was my fucking idea, right? And then I go and start talking to other people, yeah. not to you directly, and then going, Helen sat in the thing and said that it was her idea when it wasn't, right? My responsibility was to say it to you. And again, then mm -hmm. when you said, well, this is yours, do you want it? My responsibility was to say if I want to go and yeah, actually, I, I will. Yeah. And, I'm, and even if I was saying I'm going to do that next month, but yes, leave that with me. That was my responsibility. Yeah, mm. It was yours. And also to tell me if you felt upset by it or yes. hurt by it, right? And the other thing is that you could have assumed that I was doing it on purpose, mm. right? Rather than and being mean and unkind. But here's the really important part of it. Our relationship is evidence over and over and over again that I would never do that to you, that I am not a thief of ideas, <laughs> that, that you are allowed to speak up and challenge me, that I'm allowed to speak up and challenge you, that you're allowed to share with me how you're feeling. And the other side of that, again, is if you are in conflict with someone or something like that happens and in the moment you don't speak mm -hmm. up that's okay oh, that's so valid that's so okay because we can sit there going whoa what just the fuck mm -hmm. happened especially if we've got these wounds but when we're in that conflict what we then have to do is bring it up later when we realize right there is a responsibility too it's really important that you advocate for yourself in relationship because if katie hadn't said that and then had gone away and thought Maybe she did it on purpose. Maybe, you know, again, Dr. Paul, maybe she's doing this because she's trying to, I don't Ooh. know what, right? Like <laughs> yeah. he could have gone but off on a yes. load of like, yes. like a massive wormhole mm -hmm. into the things that um, I could, you could mm -hmm. be assuming a ton of intention behind my behavior, trying to make sense of it instead of just, and we do this all the mm -hmm. time, instead of just coming out and going, did you realize you nicked that idea off me? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, and it was lighthearted. Yeah. Light and I wouldn't have even used that language because I know that you didn't no, I know. nick or steal that off me, but I was just going, yeah, that's where that came from. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And it's really interesting and it's really valid that what you said that in conflict, in times, because if I was still living in survival mode, there's a really good chance that I would have been in freeze in that moment. Or if yes. I was in fight, be very reactive then and very yeah. defensive, or defensive of what was yeah. happening. Yeah. Right? Or people pleasing and not saying at all. One thing that I that I want to highlight that I would have done, it was very different because Nicola was in the meeting. So I could say that comfortably because she was a safe person. Whereas actually, if we were on any of those other meetings that we had had and you had said that, I would not have brought this up in that moment because I think that it would have shamed you and I would have said hey when we were in that call earlier you said this thing and I didn't want to bring it up then but actually that was my idea yeah and I wouldn't have brought it up with um strangers in that moment yes, yes. which now sounds very different because you're sharing this on a, on a platform but in that moment I wouldn't have done that if there wasn't a, a safe person there because I wouldn't have wanted to shame you in that moment exactly it wasn't intentional because of our relationship and your knowledge of me, mm. you might know that my shame might get triggered in front of strangers mm. who might think I was doing it mm -hmm. intentionally. Yes, because they don't know right, you. They don't know me. Mm -hmm. They don't know our relationship or whatever. And and so, yeah, and you and I, we've had that before where we've been in meetings and I've said, like, don't, and you've mm -hmm. said it to me. Yes. And, like, and, and we just navigate it. Yeah. It's totally fine because, yes, there are there is a time and a place to call someone out mm. on their behavior. And sometimes it's not right to do it in front of lots of people. Sometimes it is yeah. too, right? So, God. anyway, conflict <laughs> is something that's really yeah. difficult to navigate, especially after you've grown up in these environments and you don't know how to do it. And then, you know, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. In fact, Katie, I think it might be time to jump into let the letter, don't you? Absolutely. Okay. Dear Katie and Helen, I come from a narcissistic single mother and married at 19 to get away from home. No surprise, I dashed right into the control of another narcissist. We had two children before we divorced and he spent over three years fighting me on absolute nonsense drawing out the divorce before meeting another woman and deciding he was ready to sign the papers and let me go. He was initially mostly verbally abusive, but towards the end, after a combat-related TBI and PTSD, he became physical and I took the kids and ran. I've had to work hard and forgive myself and know that I acted when I finally realized what a serious matter our relationship was. I'm also now estranged from my mother and after much reflection and recognizing the pattern in place my entire life. My daughter was one and a half at the time and a three-year-old son when I left him, so they have no memories of us being together. 
I've remarried and my husband is incredible. We've put lots of work into healthy communication, but I am still floored that this is real life sometimes. We were friends first and he's known my kids since they were three and four. They chose to call him dad and trust him as much as I do. The first time they just wanted to talk to dad was so eye-opening. My daughter was probably five-ish. She sent me away and said she just needed dad. She might tell me later. I felt such a massive relief that she had a whole other adult she trusted and could lean on. My son was probably about six-ish before he had a similar talk and they're two peas in a pod when they get going on shared interests. To this day, I'm not sure what their talks were over, but if it was important for me to know, Hubs would have told me and they would know when they'd just need dad. They're welcome to that time and energy. In the years that have passed since my divorce, my ex has been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder during a 30-day inpatient stay for his mental health. It was no surprise to me, and it's honestly a relief to have what I knew in my heart confirmed. The strain comes in co-parenting with him and his wife. He has remarried and has three additional children, all under six. Mine are now 11 and 13, and as you've mentioned often in your podcast, they're exploring their identities, experiencing puberty, developing their own values, and pushing boundaries as kids need to do. They're honestly great kids, and I couldn't be more proud of who they are and are becoming. They're starting to struggle with their father recently, my neurodivergent daughter more than my son. They see him every other weekend, and he lives two and a half hours away. He chose to move that far, and is court ordered to do all transport on his weekends to see them. My son is the firstborn boy between X and his three siblings in a Southern Catholic family, is neurotypical and people pleases his father as much as possible. I've had to step in before to help him speak up to my ex and it's becoming more of an issue as he develops different priorities. My daughter was a surprise baby, a girl and is neurodivergent. X tells her she's difficult, doesn't practice any of the accommodations I've suggested to make his home feel safer for her. For example, a quiet space to escape the preschoolers, infants to recharge, one-on-one -on -one discussions instead of family conferences and background music at night to help her sleep. Small things that make her and everyone around her live more peacefully. And he recently devastated her to her core. My son is facing an entirely separate attack. My daughter had a meltdown due to overstimulation at his home and ex and his wife told her if she couldn't get herself together, she may not be welcome to visit weekends anymore. It could all have been avoided if her limits were respected. She's heartbroken and furious. I'm spending lots of time listening to her and letting her process her betrayal by her father, but I'm so lost from here. My son is facing entirely different pressure. He's a musician and plays flute, electric guitar, and multiple percussion instruments. He has treasured friends he plays video games with online, school band events, and music school events, including gigs with his percussion band. These, of course, overlap with his father's weekends regularly. X has started laying on the guilt over son having his own life. Half siblings miss you so much, I feel like I never see you, etc. My son can't understand why his sister can't just deal with it over the weekend. My daughter can't understand why my son can't just tell their father if he misses him so much, he should show up to events, bring the half siblings, why his brother so hung up on making him happy when their dad has the power to resolve it. I'm struggling so hard to help them both with their individual needs and to respect each other's separate struggles, but I'm lost. I don't know how to help them cope with their narcissistic father. If and when I tell them he's a narcissist and start teaching coping methods and all the while I'm deflecting my ex being critical of me, allowing them to be so rebellious and difficult towards him. I don't want them to think it's normal. They're seeing the differences between my husband and my ex and starting to ask questions. I don't know how to have them survive court ordered visits with their independent struggles without oversharing or saying too much on an appropriate level. I'm getting lost trying to stand up to my ex on their behalf. How do I help the kids flourish as themselves and not let X crush them as they are becoming their own people? And my husband is struggling with how he can support all three of us without placing himself in the middle. We have a hard boundary where I deal with my ex in conflict. He helps sharing event information and would also help advocate for the kids, but it's much more effective when I'm the one to stand up to X. Any insight and direction would be helpful. Co-parenting with a narcissist through puberty is proving to be more than I was prepared for, and I just feel lost and a little hopeless that I can't protect my children from his damage. I feel like I'm fighting off never-ending waves, shielding them from my mother, estranged, told to stay away, and she fights back against it every few months, and having to send them into the Viper's Den on their father's weekends. We thankfully have lots of other support. My aunt, mother's sister, ex's five aunts, my best friend, and some other friends close enough to know the situation. But none of us know how to get the kids through this as unscathed as possible.
They have incredible fires in their souls and every one of us would fight a bear to keep those fires from being extinguished if we only knew what to try next. Maybe that's dramatic, but my friend group is full of various flavours of neurospicy and we are who we are, which includes protecting all these kids, whether we made them or someone else did. We're like a bunch of somewhat huggable honey badgers. Thank you for reading, even if you don't have an answer. I'll gladly answer any questions you may have, especially since I didn't address much about my family of origin here. Wishing you well. Do you know, Katie, this is, first of all, absolutely fascinating. And just from a very clinical perspective of the fact that we've got someone who's actually officially diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And that gives me so much freedom to talk about it in the real clinical, theoretical terms and kind of labelling, because um, I feel somewhat inhibited sometimes when we do the podcast that I, we can't diagnose people and we can't say but the fact that this person has a diagnosis mm-hmm. not only gives both of us freedom to talk about the behavior specific to narcissistic abuse and I use the term narcissistic abuse someone tried to accuse me of ableism the other day with it but the the fact of the really? matter is yeah but but I've had it quite a few times mm. and I've done quite a few videos about why it's correct to use narcissistic abuse yeah. rather than emotional abuse because it is emotional abuse but it's specific yes. to narcissism because it centers the narcissist to all the behavior so it's all about giving the narcissist supply all the abuse is about giving the narcissist whatever supply that they need it's not just um not just there's no just about it but it's it's not emotional abuse just to be i don't know whatever it's it's narcissistic because it's so specific to narcissism and, and I've said it loads of time, that narcissistic personality disorder is differentiated from other cluster B personality disorders because there is an intent Mm. to cause harm to their significant others. And the study that showed that was Miller, Campbell and Pilconis 2007. Appreciate it's quite an old study, but it's relied on to show that the level of this abuse is not only dreadful, but it's also intentional and it's something that people really need to get to grips with because they tell me that I'm ableist and cause stigma by saying that narcissists are all abusive we know that they are Mm -hmm. it's literally the defining characteristic of the disorder itself you know the MPD is that they are abusive people they use other people to meet their needs and they exploit other people to meet their own emotional needs they are abusive and I don't I'm not going to sit and say it's ableist and stigma cause I'm not going to sit in that camp because as somebody who has disabilities and is somebody who's very conscious of ableism it is not ableist Mm -hmm. it's accurate and there's a very fucking big difference when we're calling something what it is it's dreadful I have compassion for the trauma that they um, experience that causes the MPD but there is absolutely no responsibility taking for the behavior and until someone sits in the place where they go all right I don't want to hurt people anymore you're not getting my Mm. empathy for that behavior absolutely not because all you do when you say it's ableist and you're causing stigma is justify the behavior and you tell people to tolerate it because they're traumatized because they've got this that doesn't matter trauma does not justify abuse it just doesn't it doesn't uh, justify toxic behavior And anyone that sits in my comment section and tells me that I'm ableist because I call out narcissistic abuse, go and read about it. Go and do my Mm. master's. Come and sit in my chair while I sit with my clients that have been abused by these people and tell me it's ableist. Do what I do and tell me I'm ableist because I don't think you would for a second. You wouldn't dare. The audacity would not cross your mind to sit there and tell me to be empathetic towards someone who is so chronically abusive and then let me flip it one more time and ask how much empathy you have for paedophiles because they're often abused Mm -hmm. but you know that behavior is wrong so you don't you vilify paedophiles rightly in the behavior but where's your compassion for their trauma Mm -hmm. that caused them to behave like that you cannot tell me that you can't be ableist to uh, uh, mpd people but you can to paedophile like you can't tell me that you like it's ridiculous. It, it is People ridiculous. Sitting there justifying abuse because of their trauma. No, if you're going to do that for one, do it for all. Mm. Because then we start empathizing with all abuse, and then we empower abusers and say, "Yeah, it's all right. No, never mind. It's not your fault." No, hold them accountable. Call it out. And I'm sick to fucking death of it. 
Yeah, and I fully agree, which is why I was surprised that people had even suggested mm-hmm. that it was ableism. And I think that's mm-hmm. very valid to make that clear because with this letter, there is a freedom to be able to talk about it a bit differently because they actually have a diagnosis. Yeah, and I mean, so that in itself, but also what this shows is something I talk about all the time, which is the prevalence mm-hmm. of narcissistic personality disorder and how there's thought to be between, I think it's 05 and 1.6% of the population. But that statistic is thought to be flawed because people who have NPD are going to do everything they can to yeah. avoid any kind of assessment. So if you stood in the street with a survey that was like, you know, like a Maury poll that they used to do, mm-hmm. I don't know if they still do them, and and took, I don't know, 500 people in the general population and did the survey, the minute you say to somebody, oh, it's looking at this sort of behavior, psychology or behavior, even if you don't say it's NPD, people who no, because they do know that their behavior is bad mm-hmm. or toxic, will avoid doing those surveys. So we we'll, we don't get an accurate representation of the incidence of NPD in the population. However, what the reason we even have that statistic is because there are situations where people are forced into a position where they get assessed, where they get diagnosed. And here we've got yeah. the evidence of that, where he was admitted as an inpatient to a mental health ward and therefore got assessed right and then was diagnosed with NPD so I find that absolutely fascinating just as a clinician researcher kind mm-hmm. of point of view because it evidences what we have been saying and say all the time but the freedom for us then as as therapists to be able to who specialize to be able to talk about it in a much more open way without being scared of kind of crossing that boundary of diagnosing someone is is a relief and then I sit in there and she's in a parallel parenting mm-hmm. she's called it co-parenting you can't co-parent with a narcissist you have to parallel parent with them and she's in a parallel parenting situation with someone who is uh, diagnosed MPD also has TBI which is a traumatic brain injury and PTSD and that's hard and mm. so immediately I go my researcher brain goes oh exciting and then my empathetic brain goes mm. this is so difficult raising children with someone with that diagnosis is difficult which we know anyway but here we've got real I don't know grounds to be really explaining the difficulty I don't know if that's the right word it's here you're not the problem is now available to pre-order. Links are in the show notes. And if you order now, you lock in the price and won't pay a penny until dispatch day. Yeah, Helen, my empathy for this listener is is absolutely huge for what she's experienced in her own childhood with her own mother in particular that she mentions here and then mm. entering into that relationship. So trying to escape one abusive relationship, but then into the arms of another. But just to go back on what you said there, because I think that's such an important point that a lot of people miss and around language and calling it co-parenting. And that's actually Mm. what we called one of our episodes on the Patreon, Uh, because we called it co-parenting with a narcissist. Do you know how much frustration I sit in because (laughs) I use the wrong bloody terminology? Because I did it, I do it, My, you know, Mm. we all do it. And it was me that said we're co-parenting with a narcissist. And then I just afterwards, I was like, oh, I used the wrong thing because it's not co-parenting. And throughout that episode that is available on Patreon, we do talk about that Mm. then parallel parenting because co-parenting means that we're working together. Like I am a co-host to you with Helen on this podcast. We are collaborative. It's collaborative. We're working towards the same goal. If we have disagreements, we're always working towards repair and what is the best thing. In terms of Helen, and you can even offer uh, more on this because you are a couples therapist. Uh, I had only did briefly couples therapy training. And when I was doing my training, it is that the marriage or the relationship is of the utmost importance. Yeah. So yes, the individuals... Well, the relationship is the client. The, the relationship is the client for the therapist. Yeah. yeah? Mm-hmm. So we're always in a relationship. We're working towards what is the best for the relationship. Mm-hmm. And me meeting my individual needs will be best for the relationship. So this is what we're talking about when we're saying co, is that it's, it's mm-hmm. reciprocal and that we're working towards the same end goal, that it's collaborative. And in any relationship with a narcissist, it's not collaborative. It's always about them meeting their own needs. It's all about their own gain. And so this will be the same with their relationship with their own children. They're not looking out for the children's best interest. It will all be self-serving. So here, this is where you will be parenting parallel to their parenting. 
Yeah, yeah. Because parallel parenting is different in that you do your rules in your house mm-hmm. and their rules in their house and you can't you know because when you're parenting with a narcissist you are unable to get cohesion collaboration mm-hmm. you you know because they're looking for dominance and control all the time because that's the nature of the beast right that narcissistic mm-hmm. personality disorder is about getting dominance and control over other people in order to get supply and meet needs and emotional feedback from other people that's what we mean by the way by when we say supply from a narcissist what we're talking about is emotional feedback mm-hmm. and emotional feedback is either adoration adulation glorification but it also can be loathing hatred anger because it it's all about playing that kind of getting whatever emotion they need from somebody else to feed their own need for that emotion mm-hmm. right so it's it's baiting you into arguments so that they can be angry with you and blame you for all their current uh, situations it's whether it's you know telling you how much they miss you because they want to just show that they can get you back if they want you like it's look how powerful I am, look at what I can evoke in you. And maybe I'm using you as a placeholder as well for whatever feeling that I'm feeling. So we see this again a lot with when a narcissist gets a new partner, suddenly the ex-partner will become a placeholder for hatred and Mm self-loathing and they will attack and smear and campaign against them. They'll bait them into arguments because to the new partner, they're love bombing. And so they're having to split their emotions so they're showing or rather their image so they're showing the new partner all this beautiful like I'm you're amazing you're the best thing ever and all the love bomb stuff and then to the old partner they're releasing the anger and ire where they can't release it onto the new partner yet because the new partner isn't as trauma bonded yet Mm -hmm. right this is something that people really need to hear when we're talking about your ex-partner hoovering you it's not always nice and it's not always roses sometimes it's baiting you into an argument to get you back into that cycle and just be really mindful that they don't just use you for good feelings they use you for bad ones too yeah helen absolutely and i think a lot of people get confused on that and the analogy that i use in terms of what is supply for them is that we're imagining the narcissist as a fire and then that you are fueling the fire and that mm-hmm. fuel can either be with that love adoration what you know what's fawning essentially to them yeah. but that fuel can also be your own anger and rage and trying to explain things to them and one or two things that's going to happen if you provide that love and adoration and warmth that fire can give you back warmth because it's getting the fuel that it needs. But in the same token, that when you are supplying it with anger and explanation and justification, that fire Mm -hmm. can start spitting back at you and it can get very dangerous and out of control. So this is what we're talking about, supply, and then around protection and protecting yourself. And that, yes, your anger is valid. And Helen, you have said before that there's three wonderful questions to ask yourself Mm. when going to confront a narcissist is what is the cost what is the gain and will anything change and for some people the gain is huge that I'm going to get my voice that I'm allowed my say and this is going to give me the freedom to be able to walk away from the relationship or even to show is there still am I in that toxic hope hoping that it will change Mm -hmm. for others the cost will be too great it's not even worth attempting that I'm just going to gray rock and even ghost this person. And ultimately, Mm -hmm. the same question applies to both. And the answer is generally the same. Will it change anything? And the only thing it'll change is whatever is the cost and gain to you personally. And that is a personal choice and one that we explore in therapy. And that is why me and Helen always sit and say that we will never tell you what to do because that Mm -hmm. will differ for different people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, it's about autonomy Mm. and making choices that even if you make a mistake, what did you learn from the mistake? It's okay to get something wrong. One of my favorite um, kind of sayings around when we're justifying something to a narcissist or a toxic person, what we're actually doing is giving them weapons to wound us with. Mm. We're showing them where we are vulnerable We're giving them ways and chinks into our armor so that they can get to that soft underbelly and dismiss our boundary. Mm -hmm. So when you stand there and explain to them, this is my boundary and I needed this because you, this, that, the other, and I've done that. And in my childhood that happened and I did la 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 la. What we're saying is here's all the ways you can wound me. Mm -hmm. And we have to, again, be really careful when we grow up in those environments, we learn that if we explain it hard enough, eventually we might be heard. Mm-hmm. That's the hope, have, isn't it? Right, right. 
but it doesn't matter how loud you shout. If it doesn't align with the narcissist's want or need, it's not going to happen. It's not going to make any difference. So when we're going into those conversations with somebody who's toxic and we're asking ourselves, what will it cost me? What will I gain? Will it change the outcome? What we're also saying is, am I doing it for their benefit or my yes. benefit? Am I doing it to change their behavior or to empower myself? Mm -hmm. Because if we're doing it because we're in that toxic hope of maybe this time they'll listen, that's that's going to wound you. But if you're doing it just because you will feel empowered to, to stand up and say, no, this is you, you're an ass and I don't want anything to do with you or you're this, that and the other, you can't control or dominate me anymore that's empowered, mm -hmm. right? And there's a very, again, big difference between the toxic cope and the place of empowerment when we're approaching those conversations and speaking our truths. Make sure you're doing it for your benefit, not theirs. Helen, I absolutely agree. And with all that being said, because this is very relevant to this letter and everybody's, but specifically taking it back to this listener, when we are mm. really emphasizing the difference that when somebody actually is diagnosed with NPD, because we can see with us where we don't want to sit and be armchair diagnosing. And as parents, that we don't want to be armchair diagnosing with our children. And I'm going to delve straight into this part of the letter. I don't know how to help them cope with their narcissistic father. If when I tell them he's a narcissist and start teaching coping mechanisms, I'm sitting with uh, the fear of, of being uh, brutal and wanting to respect mm -hmm. the fear that this uh, mother would have had in terms of oversharing and burdening her children. Whereas I really want to reframe that and invite you or even give you permission to tell the children. I think it's um, of paramount importance to tell mm. their children actually what they're dealing with. And Helen, I, I see you nodding along there. And mm. I'm thinking in terms of, and I'm going to move it from any other diagnosis that somebody might have. And these are non-abusive diagnoses. So if somebody has ADHD, if another parent mm -hmm. had ADHD, we're absolutely going to be involving our kids and saying, mom has ADHD, dad has ADHD, and this is what's happening. And this is why they're behaving that way. And this is how you can manage whole boundaries around that. In terms of abusive behavior, this is so important then to equip the mm -hmm. child with the knowledge mm -hmm. of what is mm -hmm. happening. Because when the listener is asking how these children can come through this as unscathed as possible, mm -hmm. this is exactly how we're doing it. By shifting the shame, by saying this is all about him. This is him and his behavior. And here you have this diagnosis that you're absolutely fundamentally being able to say it to your children, this is not you, this is him. You are not the problem here. Mm -hmm. This is your dad's struggle with his diagnosis. So mm -hmm. I think in us answering this, it'll be around in terms of how to give you language to share this with your children in an appropriate way. Yeah. And then I want to just add for anyone who's in this situation and the, there isn't a diagnosis mm -hmm. in place, you'll still be able to use quite a lot of what yes. we're going to talk about, because obviously it is rare to have that diagnosis. And it doesn't mean that you can't talk to your child about the behavior. And the biggest thing when Katie said, you know, if a parent had any other um, diagnosis like ADHD, what she's not saying is, and therefore it justifies the behavior. No. And therefore <laughs> you have to tolerate it. Mm. Right. And I think that's the really important point of the whole thing about anyone is yes there's an explanation for why they behave that way doesn't mean we have to understand it doesn't mean we have to tolerate it it means that we can put boundaries in and what we're talking about here is empowering these children mm -hmm. and empowering all children to understand what toxic and healthy look like so that they know where they can say no I'm not tolerating this I'm walking away or yes I will tolerate it or whatever it is that they can make a choice with really real understanding. And the thing is that this all comes down to something else that we talk about all the time, which is the complementary moral defense, but actually it's the moral mm. defense. But if you look, if you go to Patreon, if you're a member, if you can be a member, um, there's an entire episode about this on there, the complementary moral defense. But what we're actually talking about here is the moral defense. So a child will rather assume that they are the bad thing in a relationship uh, than that they've got bad objects, as in people around them are bad. Mm -hmm. So in order to stay safe in relationships, they assume the badness and the healthy parent goes, no, darling, you're not the bad thing. I made a mistake or I got this wrong or I shouldn't have said that and yada, yada, yada. 
the narcissistic parent locks into what's called the complementary moral defense, where they go, yes, you're right. You are the bad thing. They look at the position of perfection. Uh-huh. And they um, it's called Fairburn's moral defense, if anyone wants the uh, theoretical knowledge around it. Um, and they there's a book called um, Traumatic Narcissism by Daniel Shaw, which explains it as oh, well. I haven't but, read that one. Oh yeah, no, it's it's quite interesting. Um, it's quite hard as well. It's quite mm. it's, it's quite full on, but okay. um, but it's Pass. theoretical knowledge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, audio books. I find when yes. they're hard to read, audio books like um, the body keeps the score. Actually, I find that is a, it is a difficult one. Really to read. difficult, but so interesting. Mm-hmm. And I really wanted the knowledge, and anyway, I got it on audio book. Game changer. Mm. I like got really immersed in it. Anyway, I also think it's the print and the paperback and stuff, but. In this situation, these children will be locking into the moral defence and their narcissistic parent will be locking into the complementary moral defence. So he is going to be reinforcing the idea that they are the problem over and over and over again. Then on top of that, you've got neurodivergence. So there's black and white thinking, which means that that child is right, wrong, yes, Mm -hmm. no, me, them. Huge sense of injustice. And with the narcissistic parent, there will be so much injustice. So, but not just that, they will lock into this well they're good and I'm bad and like harder than a neurotypical child will they won't question it in the same way absolutely Helen and I know that you will know the answer to this but I suppose it's to bring it further when we're talking about emotions that when somebody thinks that they're bad when the child thinks that I'm a bad person the emotion Mm -hmm. there is shame they're feeling that they are bad therefore they are unlovable and that this is the reason why they're being treated this way, because it's yeah. it's their they are the problem, which is why we call the book "You're Not the Problem." Yeah, well, exactly yeah. right. But because the child sits in the also the space of if it's me, then I can fix it. Yeah, they're hoping that. Right? It's so powerful. The hope. They're like, well, there's the toxic mm-hmm. hope, right? Because that's the well, I might have some power in this, mm-hmm. and in fact, what we're saying is you have no power. They are going to treat you like that, whatever you do, unless you are aligning exactly to what they want. And that means that you're killing yourself emotionally Mm -hmm. because you're pretending to be something you're not. And they're denying all your autonomy, all the things that make you, you. And in our, in the letter, this is exactly what our listener is saying. Like they have these incredible fires in their souls. And every one of us would like, would fight a bear to keep those fires from being extinguished. If we only knew what to try next. Now, Here's the thing about it is that they've clearly had a lot of autonomy Mm -hmm. given to them. They've clearly got a good sense of themselves. Mm -hmm. And you can see that being around him is killing that autonomy. It means that they have to oppress it and suppress it in order to stay safe. And so, again, going back to what Katie was saying is this is about empowerment, psychoeducation. You talk about narcissistic personality disorder and you weaponize them with the information so that they can protect themselves. Because because you've got that diagnosis, this isn't going to be you smear campaigning him. And this is, you know, and of course we get into that danger zone of do am I doing that? And it's good to self-reflect and think about whether you're doing that. But what actually we're telling you to do is explain it. Explain what toxic behavior is. They're 11 and 13. They're not mm-hmm. two and three or five. These are children who are able to process and think critically and are also old enough nearly to make the decision. I'm really interested about the court aspect and the demand for contact because also at this age, typically what will happen is that um, courts will start looking at the child making the Mm -hmm. decision rather than them making the decision. So I'm wondering how much longer they have to have those court audit visits and whether or not they want to go, what their feelings are about being there and giving them an autonomous voice in that too. Because just because the court has had this in place for a while doesn't necessarily mean it needs to stay in place. And I would just invite you to reflect on that aspect too. Not, And here's the thing, people are going to go, oh my God, you're parental alienation. If it's a toxic parent, mm. yeah. If they're being wounded by this parent, then yes, because it's not safe for them. Just because somebody has a DNA connection to you, it doesn't justify them being in your life. It doesn't mean that they get to be in your life. And this is something I've been through personally and professionally, that that the DNA connection should not override safety on any level. And if these children at 11 and 13 are saying, actually don't want to be there as much, want maybe this relationship to look like this, whether it's like we just go for lunch with them once a month, or we do this every now and again, or, or we don't stay there, but we go and visit and then give them a voice. But ultimately, 
you've remembered that because you've got that diagnosis, you can give them the, the empowerment and the knowledge. And if you haven't got a diagnosis, you can still talk about toxic behavior and how that made them feel and get them to self-reflect. Whenever we're talking about children and parenting with a, uh, somebody who's got toxic behavior, we're always asking the children to self-reflect on their own experience, their own emotional experience, because not only does that mean they're making any decisions or choices for themselves, it also is teaching them to connect to themselves, which is what the narcissistic parent demands that they don't do. So we're countering that kind of very toxic behavior by saying, well, what's your thought? What's your opinion? What would you think? How did it make you feel? We're not necessarily telling them. We might say something like, do you know, if someone did that to me, it might feel like X, Y, Z not you feel like we're like that might make me feel what do you think and they might say yeah that's exactly it or they might go no that didn't happen for me and both are valid answers and you listen to it so you give them a voice you know it's really important it's huge and Helen you already said it that it sounds like already that they have their own voice in this instance in particular where the daughter here at 11 years of age that she can't understand why the son can't just tell the father that if he misses him so much that well why don't you just come to the events on the weekend that you have me when I have an event why don't you come to me and you know we say out of the mouths of babes because that that is the truth here is the adult if he is missing the child why doesn't he go to him and again this is where you have the power to educate with narcissistic personality disorder, with educating the mm -hmm. children saying, no, because with dad, it's always all about meeting his needs and he won't meet the child's needs. He won't meet somebody else's need unless there's a gain in it for him. And I hear in the letter, you trying to balance that from them having such two different opinions that here, it sounds like the son is fawning to the father, is people pleasing to the father to not be put in the position where he is scapegoated. And it sounds like that that is already happening with the daughter that when she's being blamed that she's being dramatic and that that her outbursts are too much and that she's going to be punished and you won't be allowed to come here anymore and again yeah. i actually think when you're talking about how do i manage this it is in terms of around education if we use this example about the son feeling guilty about wanting to meet his own needs going to you know any of his extracurricular activities and the daughter saying, why don't you just tell him that actually this is an opportunity to explore you with your son having that conversation, or I'm fully seeing another safe person here who they're calling dad, your now husband, mm -hmm. in, in exploring that. I'm wondering what do you think might happen if you say this to him? And if your son feels safe enough naming it, what he'll say is, well, basically what he will be describing is some sort of punishment. No, he'll get mad, he'll be upset. And again, this is in terms of around the peace around education. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's identifying with the son, the fear, mm. the fear, obligation and guilt and talking to them about that and how we shouldn't be fearful of our parents, particularly, and we shouldn't feel obliged to make someone else more comfortable by making ourselves uncomfortable. And we don't have to feel guilty if someone gets upset because we say no to them when we're not doing anything to hurt them. And so, again, we're coming back to this empowerment, giving them language, kind of giving them knowledge. And that moment that you were talking about, Katie, about how... Um, she had a meltdown due to overstimulation at his home and X and his wife told her if she couldn't get herself together, she may not be welcome to visit weekends anymore. How dare they? It, <laughs> I mean, how fucking dare mm -hmm. they? It all could have been avoided if her limits were respected. You're right. If her limits, her autonomy, her needs were being met, she wouldn't have had the meltdown, right? And even if she had had the meltdown, it should have been managed and helped and looked after and nurtured and talked about. Instead, what she got was a threat of abandonment for non-compliance. And that's what narcissists do. And that's how they create the trauma bond, because they threaten to abandon you, reject you, stop loving you if you stop being the person that they demand you are, stop attending to all their needs and, and meeting all their expectations. They threaten to abandon you for non compliance. So remember that if you have to be silent and compliant in a relationship, that's not a relationship. That's an exercise of dominance and control. And your daughter deserves better, which I think she does recognize. But your son also does the same. He's people pleasing because that's silence mm -hmm. and compliance, right? And your son is learning that he stays safe by staying small and making dad happy. And that is a really dangerous set of behaviors for him to be learning and in integrating into his personality, because that's then going to start playing out in all important relationships, if not all relationships, because 
he's not going to be able to say no to people for fear of their abandonment. So, yeah. And the other thing I would actually be adding on to all of this around the psychoeducation is therapy. Give them a neutral space where they can talk about you and your ex and their other, uh, their stepfather, about how they feel around the whole situation where they can pick it apart without with somebody who doesn't have any agenda, which is the whole point of a therapist. Helen, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I'm such an advocate for therapy for everybody because what you were even saying there about identifying the fear, obligation and guilt, this isn't a one-time conversation. This is about constantly bringing awareness mm -hmm. to those emotions. And we're actually doing a series on that on the Patreon at the minute and really exploring in depth individually that fear, obligation and guilt and how that then plays out in every relationship. And in helping him identify this, what you are doing is validating his experience, giving him a voice. You are allowing mm -hmm him autonomy and you're building identity by allowing him to get in touch with his own emotions to name what's actually happening and again you're shifting the shame because you're showing that the responsibility of the behavior is down to his narcissistic father and that that is not his to carry yeah it's not and i think that's something else to ed educate our children around again all children is that we are not responsible for anyone else's emotions when we're not deliberately causing or provoking them. And especially when it's an adult's uh, emotions. I, I read something the other day, it hit me so hard and it's so fucking true. And it's never trust an adult that won't apologize to a child. Mm. Because look at the superiority in that. Look at the control. Look at the dominance. Look at the ego wound in it. I am so egotistical. I'm so desperate to protect my own wounds that I refuse to concede to a child that I was anything other than perfect. And I will in deliberately force that child to think that they are the one that is wrong in the problem by not apologizing to them. Because somehow, because my body is bigger than theirs and older, I've got superiority over them. Absolutely not. And, and it's absolutely atrocious. So yeah, absolutely never trust an adult who doesn't apologize to a child ever. Helen, absolutely. And, and this listener is saying that I don't want my kids to think that this is normal. You can absolutely own that and verbalize to them. This is not healthy. I, the, the word normal, actually, this is their normal. So that's the difficulty I have when we use the word normal. What is normal? Mm. And it actually is their normal because this is half their normal, what they're dealing with when they're, you know, going to his house. But you can say this is not healthy. How he is treating yeah. you is unfair, wrong, unjustified, uncalled for. This is not healthy. And it's really interesting that you say that when you're dealing with telling them, all the while you're deflecting with your ex being critical of you and you have inverted commas, allowing them to be so rebellious and difficult mm -hmm. towards him. So here we can see his projection onto them having boundaries and autonomies, that he is already calling them rebellious and difficult, and he's already criticizing you for doing that. And I suppose the question that I have for you to reflect on yourself as, I wonder how much you're engaging in that conversation and how much you're explaining yourself. I hear you saying you're deflecting it. And when I think of gray rocking, that absolutely is, that's what that is. And it's deflecting the conversation and moving it forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas let's say yellow rocking is acknowledging what is being said and refuting it in the moment in a, in a non-aggressive uh, manner. So you're saying, I disagree with your interpretation that you are saying that I am allowing them to be rebellious and difficult. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, what you are doing then is standing up for yourself in that moment while not trying to engage, explain away what's happening. Because again, you're getting caught in the trap then of, of hoping that things will be different because nothing is yeah. going to change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Yellow Rock, when it comes to navigating these relationships, especially when there's courts involved, is literally the most effective way to communicate with somebody who is showing traits of narcissistic personality disorder, because it's essentially it's calling out the bullshit. It's it's removing the emotion. It's stopping you getting baited into arguments and it's being able to hold your boundaries whilst not justifying or explaining. So, you know, what we don't want you to do is get caught into a tit for tat like explanation. It's just mm -hmm. blanket statements. I disagree with your interpretation. You don't need to take it any further. And again, if they come back, well, and like, or how dare you speak to me like that? 
you just don't respond. You don't have to engage. And I think actually the conflict aspect of this situation is really interesting that you have a hard boundary where I deal with my ex in conflict, mm. conflict, but your husband doesn't get involved. And it says he helps with sharing event info and would help advocate for the kids, but it's more effective when I'm the one to stand up to ex. And I'm not quite sure. And there's some assumption that we sort of have to make about what that looks like, but one thing I've noticed throughout the letter is it's you managing everyone, you managing everyone's feelings, everyone's thoughts, everyone's kind of behavior and protecting everyone more than anything. It's not really that you're managing, it's that you're protecting everybody. And I want to know who's protecting you, mm -hmm. because I wonder if your husband being supportive is lovely, but I just wonder whether there's a point where he could be a bit more protective towards you. And when there's conflict what, what are we talking about? Kind of what kind of conflict is that? That he's just standing by while you're arguing, or is he, you know, is he in the room? Is he out the room? Is it is that even the situation at all? Are we talking about phone calls, text messages? I absolutely respect the boundary of this is your situation to deal with, and it's your children and and that sort of thing. But he is still your partner, and there is still a part where he can play the the protective partner aspect and I wonder what it would be like for you to be protected because I wonder if that would actually trigger you because it might make you feel fearful that either you're going to have to pay for it or that it's not genuine or you're being a burden and you said at the end of the letter you didn't address much about your family of origin and and it does make me query what was that like were you an instrumentally parentified child where you held the responsibility for everyone because that's what I'm seeing play out in this aspect too. And and I wonder what it would be like to just shift that hard boundary a little bit and allow him to share that load with you a touch because he's dad to those children too and he is your partner. So he, he should A, have a voice if he wants it, but also you should have the protection too, you know? Helen, you're absolutely right. And I had highlighted that part myself because I wondered that about her. Um, and I was absolutely hearing the hyper-independence that I can do all, all this. This is what I've done my whole life. Why would never be any different? And I'm going to, I'm managing here. So I'm managing my now husband saying, okay, this is what you can do and, and as much as you can do, but I'm going to carry the weight then of dealing with the conflict with him face on and you're managing that. And I also hear that you're also managing your narcissistic mother that you're saying that you're now estranged from. But then further down in the letter, you say you feel like you're fighting off never ending waves, shielding them from your mother, because although you're estranged and told her to stay away, she fights back against it every few months. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm wondering where your husband is playing out in that role, again, in terms of support. Is this something that you are saying, no, this is something that I fight alone? Or where is he there supporting you and in supporting, not answering the door or opening the door and telling her not to come? Or where actually, if he was given the freedom in this, if you were to actually say, if you had control over this, what would you do? Mm, I'm wondering what step further question. he might take yeah. that. Well, I would have phoned the guards. I would have done this. This is mm -hmm. the next step that I would have done, but I didn't want to overstep with you. And to go to that place, firstly, you can say, what if? This is not that I am suggesting that you give him full control, but it's asking, if you had the freedom to do what you wanted here, what would that be? And in yeah. that, I'm imagining the fear, right? Because when somebody mm -hmm. grows up, and Helen, I agree with you, with the parentification aspect, either instrumental or emotionally parentified, they are trying to do everything with control. This is where when a child is growing up with anxiety and they try to control with the food that they're eating and they subsequently, you know, kind of an eating disorder or in terms of cleanliness that they're constantly trying to clean and do because they have all this anxiety in their body. And the only way they know how to keep themselves safe is by this control. And here now, we are are suggesting to you, inviting you to relinquish that control and how actually this younger self, this inner child might be so terrified. And I, and I wouldn't even say might, I would say will be so terrified to let that go that you hear the adult, the rational brain can see, okay, I'm in a safe, healthy relationship now. Mm -hmm. And I have all these external supports, which is absolutely huge and crucial in this in terms of support and healing. But for you to actually relinquish some of that control will really mm -hmm. tap into this inner child and for that inner child to be really scared. And in the same way that you would be sitting with your son saying, I wonder if you do this, what would the fear be? What, you know, yeah. Where is the obligation? Where is the guilt? Mm -hmm. Where do you think that you're a bad child? And to give yourself space to reflect on those 
questions for yourself. If you were to relinquish that control with your partner in order to allow him the support in, in conflict with your ex or even with your mother, what is happening to you? What is the fear? What, what are you scared that might happen? Where is the obligation? Yeah. Where is the guilt? And where does the child think that they would be a bad person if the subsequent said things happen? You know what I'm hearing as you've been talking mm. and I've been thinking about it and I've been sitting here going, something's going on because why is the mother being able to get to you every few months? Why, you know, why are you managing the conflict alone or, you know, you've got all this support around you. Why are the children not being told the full truth? Why mm. haven't they been told the full truth? So, you know, earlier, like sooner. And I, I'm making an assumption that he was diagnosed years ago. So it might be that he was diagnosed yesterday and we don't know about it. But I'm sitting here and all I can keep coming into my head is you're shrinking to avoid the conflict. Oh. You're hiding. You're trying not to upset the apple cart. If I if I stand up too tall, if I fight back too hard, I'm going to make my life and everyone else's life more difficult so I need to try and keep things as smooth as possible to risk attack to avoid the risk of attack and I'm sitting here with this feeling of oppression on the listener that she doesn't want to be to blame when it all goes wrong mm -hmm. like there's something about see see my first thought was well if your mum's continuing to contact you we talk all the time about there's a point where you can call the police and, and report it for harassment because that's harassment. If you've been told to stay away and you continue to fight back against that and you continue to turn up, send things, contact in any way, shape or form, that is harassment. Full stop. Right? I'm in full agreement for people that aren't watching. Right? I'm, I'm nodding yeah, away. Yeah, nodding away. So that's harassment. That's reportable it's you can get a restraining order against that in most countries. I know some countries not. And so why hasn't that happened? If this is a continuous pattern, why, what are you scared of there? Right. And then it is the, and I'm not judging. I just want to make it really clear. I'm not judging mm -hmm. you. I'm just trying to unpick it with like, as though you were right next to me, but I'm just trying to understand why didn't you tell the children about the diagnosis that before when they're 11 and 13? Why, why haven't we been telling the truth? Why haven't we been standing in power? Because what I'm hearing is shrinking to avoid upsetting the apple cart, to avoid retaliation, to avoid that conflict that you have to then manage on your own. And it makes me really sad for you. Oh. It makes me so sad for you because you're clearly in the right. There's there's clearly nothing that you're doing that isn't obviously on the other side, you know, the other party. And I, and I just noticed the amount of fear here. So what I'm then sitting with is, have you worked on that? Are you in therapy? Because if you grew up in this environment, fear, obligation and guilt are going to be strong for you. And here's the guilt of dragging your husband into the potential conflict. Here's the guilt of putting it on your friends. Here's the obligation to be the one that carries it all. Here's the fear of speaking up, putting hard boundaries in with the toxic people and suffering some kind of retaliation, retribution. And I just, you know, really want to notice that because it was sitting heavy on me. I couldn't figure out what was going on and just... What I'm hearing is because on the surface, sorry, Casey, I know you want to say something, but because <laughs> on the surface of it, you look really together. You look like you've got it all sorted, worked out, know what's going on. You're self reflective, you're self analytical, you're looking at things, you're understanding things, you're looking at other people's perspective, you're looking at this, that, and the other. But I'm hearing a scared child mm. and a really scared child. And it's totally valid. No judgment, no shame, no blame. But I noticed the fear. And I'm going to invite you to notice to stop focusing on everyone else's experience and start looking at your own, because that's where the answers all lie. Helen, it's amazing that when we get in touch with this inner child work to then see the facade of the hyper independent. And again, I'm not saying that with any judgment and one that I can hugely relate to being that hyper independent and one just being so familiar with that role. Well, this is what I've always done. But then actually challenging that and delving further and saying, what is the fear here? And especially I agree with you around letting the children know um, his diagnosis. And I wonder still, is it the fear of his wrath? Because he, I'm assuming, 
is reluctant to allow that information to be shared. And when we look at, right, well, why is he reluctant? Well, he probably even denies it's true, Casey, because, of course, you know, <laughs> okay. he knows better than everybody who's diagnosed him. Don't forget. Because, again, you know, when I... we go right back to the beginning of this episode, when you're talking about there's intent, if there was something wrong with me, if I had some diagnosis and that meant that I was going to act in a way that I had impaired self-awareness around, I would absolutely want my children especially to know this, to know that it's not them because I wouldn't want to mm-hmm. hurt them. Mm. And then here, when we're talking about intent, here he is not wanting, or den- or if that's true, even denying it, but definitely not wanting the children to know this. And that that proves the point exactly. Why would he not want to, them to know this? Where is the gain in it for him? But again, taking it back to you, I'm wondering what is the fear in you expressing that and the fear of his wrath? And where do you feel obligated in protecting the parent? And again, if we go right back to your parents, where did you feel obligated protecting them and guilty? And I'm even wondering when your mother is turning up, how much you are able to hold that space when she's turning up for a fight. I'm wondering how much this still triggers you because she is a threat and how much you're able to recognize that this is her fighting for something. So I wonder again how much you engage with that or explain. Mm. So when she turns up, do you not answer the door? Can you send your husband to the door or do you phone the guards? Right. And and how much yeah. does this cost you afterwards? What is the impact of this on you and your nervous system emotionally? And again, we're going back to the diagnosis actually being such a tool for education purposes that you can use because now with your mm. kids, you can say, you know, my my mom was very like your dad. And so I've had mm-hmm. to hold boundaries there. And the part with mm-hmm. that is that you don't need to share your own personal experience, what you've experienced mm-hmm. with your mom. But when she turns up that you're absolutely able to say that's wrong, that's the uncalled for. There's no need for that. That's extremely unhealthy. That's dangerous behavior. That's abusive behavior. What's happening here and now. And again, so you're empowering the kids to be able to recognize that you're empowering your kids to recognize with their father when they're sharing stories with you. Hmm, that's he's deflecting the in the conversation there. It sounds like he's denying your reality and not allowing you a safe space to speak with your son. It sounds mm-hmm. like you might be a bit scared or I wonder what you might think happens if you say this thing to him. So you're giving a voice in acknowledging that. And I wonder again, there's that aspect of letting your husband come in, how much he mightn't keep the peace. When Helen used that terminology, not to upset the apple cart, I wonder where he might fucking upturn the apple cart and say, no more. This is ridiculous. Absolutely, Katie. It's so important to empower these children and give them space and a voice to both criticise their father and to criticise you and their stepfather too. And as we've been going through this letter, every time I've kind of mentioned it or Katie's mentioned the fact that there's the diagnosis, I my mind immediately trips to all the people who um, don't have the person mm. that they're talking about diagnosed. That they, there isn't a diagnosis in place, and and I recognise the power that having that diagnosis can give our listener. Mm-hmm. Right, it, it's a huge, huge kind of playing card almost. I don't, I don't. It's not a game, and I don't. I can't find the right word for it. But it's this this idea that there is an undeniability to the diagnosis right so it's that thing of he's doing all this behavior and you can attribute some of it to the diagnosis you know and and maybe some of it's tbi maybe it's some of it's ptsd but you can say well we know that this is happening for him Mm -hmm. we know that he has this diagnosis and we know that that makes his behavior be difficult and and actually can be abusive and toxic so i'm recognizing how empowering that is for somebody in this who's been victimized by this abuse to have somebody diagnosed and you know I think this might even be the first letter that we've read that has a diagnosis an official diagnosis Mm -hmm. involved and what I want to say to everyone that doesn't have the diagnosis is the thing I say all the fucking Mm -hmm. time the behavior is enough it doesn't matter why the behavior is there. The behavior is enough to decide whether or not you want to be in a relationship with that person. We do not have to understand it. We do not have to tolerate it because it came from trauma. The behavior is enough. We don't have to label it. We don't have to have the diagnosis. The way that this empowers this listener is speaking to her children. There is absolute proof that what I'm talking about is not a he said, she said. It's an absolute truth that your father has been diagnosed with this condition, this disorder, which 
by right rote makes his behavior extremely difficult, extremely challenging, and actually dangerous, right? We know that that's the truth. And that's hugely powerful for our listener. But my empathy is sitting as well with those that don't have that. But again, the behavior is enough. It's Hutel and I too am sitting with that because we are putting such emphasis the fact that this listener has the diagnosis. But in terms of the language, the language we're going to use is the same because it's the same language we've used in mm-hmm. all other, you know, 98 episodes that we've done when yeah. we're describing this behavior. And if we use the example in this listener's letter with the ex and the mother, the language mm-hmm. will be the exact same. So if the mother turns up on the doorstep, we'll be saying, she did not listen. She does not care. She is not respecting boundaries. This is dangerous behavior. This is abusive behavior. So the one mm-hmm. thing that you won't have what your mother is saying, she is diagnosed narcissistic personality mm-hmm. disorder, but all the language will be the same that we are using. Mm-hmm. And it is all 100% valid in the same way that you're using it here with your ex. But I do understand the weight and the extra uh, power that that gives to you that you know this and what we're offering to you or inviting you to do is to one, use that power with your children to, because the tools that they will be able to learn from this are just massive. And Mm -hmm. then in terms of power, it's to share that, to let your guard down, let your armor down and let go of some of that control when it comes to your husband in allowing him to support you, in allowing him to care for you and being able to sit in a space with that. And at the beginning, I imagine that that may be very uncomfortable, um, Mm. but, but stay with it and see what unfolds. Yeah, absolutely. Because above all, above everything else, you deserve as much support as anybody else in this situation mm. because we're talking about your childhood trauma and then we're talking about relationship trauma and then we're talking about vicarious trauma, watching your children be abused by yeah. their father. So you deserve protection, support and kindness too. And what I'm going to invite you to do is stop focusing on everyone else for a minute. Put yourself first and last and everyone else in between because you deserve that. And I wonder if you've ever allowed yourself that thought too because just like anyone else that listens. We are all important. We are all worthy. We all deserve love, care, and protection. Mm. And Helen, I think that's a great way to wrap up this week's episode. I absolutely agree. So Katie McKenna, what is your win then this week? I am really excited. I have just booked my flights uh, to come over to you to record the (laughs) book at the end of this month. I'm so excited about that. I can't wait. And I'm just so excited to get to share this with somebody and do that again when we're talking about writing the book. One of the things that I didn't think was actually how much of a lonely process it would be mm-hmm. doing on our own and even the same going doing an audiobook. So I'm so delighted to be able to share that with you and another good excuse to get to go over and see you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my win. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? I'm so thrilled we get to yeah. all together. It's, it's lush. And I'm going to throw it back to you and say, what is your win? Do you know what? It's going to be holding boundaries and actually probably around things like the audiobook and like we've had loads of marketing and publicity meetings mm-hmm. this week about how we can promote the book best. And it's the fact that we are holding boundaries about us being a pair. Mm. Like, you know, so like we started off talking about the luxury mind and as we're individuals and everything else, and that that there are places where it's absolutely appropriate yeah. that we stay the pair and that our relationship is a huge part mm-hmm. of the book. As much as anything else, obviously it's massive of the podcast anyway, but but there's just something so empowering about saying, no, this is absolutely what mm. has to happen. And obviously there is flexibility. Yeah. Like we're not that hard ass about it, but it's the the thing of we always want to try and do stuff together. For, the first option always has to be to do it together. Mm-hmm. And then if it has to be one or the other of us, then that's fine. We'll make it work. But it's and what's so lovely about that, I think this is my childhood wound stuff, <laughs> is <laughs> what's so lovely about that is being equal mm. and not being overpowered, not being silenced, not being, you know, I remember when we first, sorry, this is going to turn into a massive waffle mm-hmm. now. When we first started, I was quite anxious about not being as valued as you were. Mm. I and, remember you sharing that. Yeah, and feeling quite... Um, yeah, quite fearful that like you would become like this global sort of Oprah Winfrey <laughs> and I would just be the silent little 
small partner and yeah no um yeah no I, I actually did it with Katie McKenna at one point and there'd be people being like oh my god you were in the Beatles that kind of feel <laughs> like mm. I genuinely yeah. was quite fearful oh, yeah. of that and there is a reason for it mm-hmm. because that's how my family dynamic worked someone was always more important than someone else and I mean most people will recognize that with the golden child like family system anyway what's so delightful for me is that that's not happening mm. in any way shape or form and Every time we get offered something individually, we bring it to the other mm-hmm. to see if we can, if it's appropriate. And again, this is not to say we can't do stuff on yeah. our own and won't do stuff on our own. It's just to say that there are, that it's always about, it's like pulling each other along rather than trying to hold you down while I'm ahead or the other way around. My experience has always been that one person is ahead of the other and there's an imbalance and that's not happening. And it's, it's a really nice thing. So there's my win. Boundaries. It's a huge win and I get that this is going on a little bit longer. But again, this is in terms of when we look at responsibility. You felt this way back at the beginning and you own that and share that with me and said, Mm. this is a fear that's happening. And so then it was like, okay, let's manage expectations. And when that does happen, what do we want that to look like? And Mm -hmm. then one of the things that I was really passionate about is also that, well, as an individual, then let's talk about what kind of is or isn't acceptable. So we were able to manage expectations going forward, uh, express ourselves what we wanted and needed and what that's just made me realize is that's why I feel so safe now Mm. because oh wow yeah (laughs) yeah because we've had that so many times where you've been offered something Mm -hmm. or I've been offered something and I'll bring try and bring you in you try and bring me in maybe it hasn't worked like when I did women's hour for example Mm -hmm. and I tried to get you on board to can Katie come and do it too yada yada and they said no and there was this little bit of like guilt and fear but then you were just so delighted that I got it. And it was and it was the same when you did whatever news. Was it Fox yeah, News? Yeah, Fox News. And yeah. Yeah. And like I remember you getting the email and being delighted mm. for you because there wasn't any of that fear that mm-hmm. you were going to use this as a leap pad to push me down so you could yeah. get, you know, it's like you're not using me as a stepping stone. And oh, I think that's yeah. 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 Oh, Helen, what a win. What, and I yeah, what a win. Yeah. And I think that's actually a great way to end Didn't the episode. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't expecting that win and but, there, okay, carry on. but look at when there's that win and then what we demand then in other relationships yeah from that. yeah well exactly mm. yeah look at my night last night where yeah. everyone's cheering me on and saying how brilliant it is instead of resenting my success mm. oh and wow there are you know it's a big it's a big change in my life it is it's huge and on that note i'd like to thank our sponsors pinch of nam and boston alehouse all the listeners especially the patreons absolutely everyone thank you so much this is just what a year ahead so we can't wait for you to be on the ride and I've already said that before but it's still true anyway (laughs) I guess all that remains to be said is take care Bye. bye this podcast has been edited by Sam Atkinson whose link is in the bio take care bye